Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here at the Bowling Green. Be sure to say hi and let me know if you're here. And of course, if you have any comments or questions during our tour today, please let me know. I've been experimenting with my right microphone. I'm in a somewhat populous area, so I am wearing a mask. And I think I have the microphone positioned pretty well. But if you have trouble hearing me, please let me know and I will adjust it a little bit. And I'm just going to wait a few minutes for more people to join us here. And what we're seeing here right now is a view of Bowling Green Park. And I'm standing on the steps of the Customs House or the um, Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian. And I'm just going to wait a few more minutes for people to come in and join us. Um, hi, Ellen. It's always great to see you. Thank you for joining. Oh, it's a beautiful day here. I hope you can hear the birds singing in the trees. We can look up. We're going to talk about all these buildings in a little while. And we're going to talk about some of the old things that we find here as well. And this is a little bit of a look at where I'm standing. And I will back up and tell you more about this in a little while. This is the entrance to the museum or the old customs house. And as you can see, we have some pretty exquisite statuary here to talk about. So we're going to have a great time today um, talking about the uh, almost 400 year history of New York City. Oh, you can hear me fine. Great, great, great. I'm so glad. So let's talk about where we are. So I'm going to walk down the steps here and I hope you'll excuse my um, shaking camera. I have ordered a stabilizer and I don't have it yet. So until then, um, we'll just have to uh, put up with my shaking camera. So I'm down the steps and some of you who've taken my tours might remember, especially if you took my old Civil War era tour, that we started that tour right there um, where I was just standing, which gives us a beautiful view of the Bowling Green. So I'm going to come over here to Bowling Green Park and the cobblestones you're seeing beneath my feet are not original. They're uh, modern cobblestones. So those are not original, although we might see some original ones on our tour today. And we're coming up to the park and I'm going to stop here by the fence of the park, which we're also going to talk about, but just to give us a little bit of orientation about where we are. So there's the customs house, the subway entrance, if you're familiar with that, the Bowling Green subway entrance, a loud truck battery park over there where we'll be heading. And of course, the old Bowling Green. Now where I'm standing is the original tip of the island. So if we fire up our imaginations a little bit, standing um, in front of us instead of the Bowling Green would have first been Fort Amsterdam and over there the battery. The shore is directly behind that building with the blue awnings on it. So everything behind that building is landfill. And in the distance there, you can see a structure we're going to walk out to, Castle Clinton, that's way out in the water at our time. The shore is about um, partway between that flagpole and the Castle Clinton in the background. Um, John wanted to do the Civil War era tour. I might resurrect that tour or I might do a virtual version of that tour. Um, Perhaps I'll do a Wall Street tour and talk about um, all the Civil War stuff that happened in Wall Street because that is really scandalous and fun. Um, okay, so we're back here to the Bowling Green. So that was the original shore behind the building with the blue awnings and just beyond the flagpole that you see there. So you can see we have a lot of landfill we're going to talk about today. We're going to be talking about different eras of landfill because this occurred in segments over a very long period of time. So to start out, let's pretend we're down here at what was Fort Amsterdam. New York was, um, or as oh, Civil War, okay, I will bring back the Civil War tour. Um, I had a very interesting reason for um, stopping that tour, but I might, I might bring it back um, only by appointment because, you know, I, it started evoking too many arguments on the tour. So I, I might do it only by request to try to avoid some of the arguing that went on on that tour. So if we're looking straight ahead, um, when this was the little village of New Amsterdam, part of a settlement called New Netherland, a Dutch area, we're looking up what today is Broadway, but you need to pretend you're just looking up a country lane. And that's all it is. These are all dirt country roads. This is just a little settlement of um, farms and traders. And uh, New Amsterdam was never quite as profitable as it could have been, but it was potentially profitable because over there we have the Hudson River, behind us we have the harbor, 
and then around to the other side, a few blocks over there to our right, we have the East River. So from this little tip of Manhattan Island, we have access to all the Northeast um, of the American colonies or then the colonies. So from the East River, you could get to Long Island and New England, right? The East River goes out into something we call the Long Island Sound. And it isn't really even a river, it's just a part of the Long Island Sound. And you know, at colonial times, they actually called that the Sound River as they recognized it wasn't a true river. And then later the name East River came around. And over here, the Hudson River or Hudson's River, or as they also called it, the North River, all the way up into uh, the interior of what today is New York State. And then the harbor right behind us, directly accessible from the Atlantic Ocean. So a very key place to be if you are engaging in maritime trade. So the Dutch settled first, and along with the local Lenape, with whom they generally got along very well, except for a few very sad um, occasions in history, um, they mostly got along very well and traded with each other. The little town began to grow, and over to the right, in the direction we're facing, where the MTA office building is today, would have been a street called Stone Street. If you were with me last week, we walked on Stone Street, and that street would have led from here, Fort Amsterdam, down to the major dock or port in New Amsterdam. Um, they weren't too uh, interested in the Hudson River at that time. All trade was conducted on the East River and the harbor. Oh, thank you for the nice, thank you for the nice comment. Thank you for liking my tours. I love come out, coming out and doing them. I've been so sad these last eight months not having people out every day with me learning all of this great stuff. So thank you all for watching. So the town grew and the northern border at the town that time, I should tell you when it was New Amsterdam, was what we today call Wall Street. And of course there was a wall there built by the Dutch as the northern border of their town. It was just a wooden wall that ran along where Wall Street is today. And they did not build it to keep the local tribes out, they built it to keep the Spanish and the English and the French out. So we'll just, you know, won't talk about those uh, European rivalries today. We <laughs> don't talk about New York. So this is just a um, little farming village and trading village. That building you see um, straight in the middle that's all brick, that's the Hudson River. So that's water over there. So we're not going to really talk about that too much today, but just a little when we talk about the expansion of the town. So eventually the value of this land is not lost on the English, who of course are colonizing all around it. And the English um, arrive to invade the town. The Dutch really can't fight the English, so they do what the Dutch were so good at doing. They came out and said, let's make a deal. And they made a deal, right? New York is all about making deals, and they made a deal that they would hand over the colony without any fighting if they got a few things in return, and that was called the Articles of Capitulation. In 1664, we became New York, and the Fort Amsterdam that you see behind me became Fort George. Well, not Fort George yet. It became a fort. By the Revolutionary War, it's going to be named Fort George. As we go through different monarchs, the fort will have different names. Now, the oldest thing remaining down here from that time period is the Bowling Green. So let's walk over to the Bowling Green and we'll talk about it. The park was created in 1741 as a Bowling Green. Now, if you lived on either side of the Bowling Green um, during the 1700s, so we'll say like the 1740s through the American Revolution and after, if you lived along here on Broadway on either side around the Bowling Green, you were living in the most exclusive part of New York City. The most beautiful mansions lined the lower Broadway. So this was the place to live. It was a wide tree lined street. You can see over here, it kind of curves and goes up to uh, the middle of Manhattan Island. So it was wonderful to live here. Um, the fountain was not here yet, but the Bowling Green Park was founded so that people could come out and bowl on the green as an afternoon and evening sport. So people came out and they socialized and bowled on the green, thus the Bowling Green. And to um, have the Bowling Green in operation, the rent from the city of New York at that time, I think was one peppercorn a year. So it was pretty much donated to the people to use as a public space. Now, the fence was not here yet. The fence comes a little bit later. Before the fence, right here where you see the fountain in front of us, was a statue of King George III, a massive statue up on a pedestal that depicted King George riding a horce in the fashion of a Roman emperor. <laughs> kind of 
funny to us, but, you know, fashionable at that time. And as King George became less and less popular and his reign and Parliament became less popular, the fence was put up to protect the Bowling Green and the statue. And um, I'll get a little closer in a few minutes, but on top of that fence were crown finials that lined the top of the fence, surrounded the fence. Well, some of you might know that on July 9th, 1776, after the Declaration of Independence was read, a huge crowd came down that Broadway, that kind of cavern, um, or we call it the Canyon of Heroes, where we have ticker tape parades today. You can see it running up through the middle of the picture right now. A huge crowd came down the Broadway from the Commons where the Declaration was read. They tore down the statue of the King and they knocked every crown finial off of this fence. And um, the statue is long gone. There are pieces of it in the New York Historical Society, but we will see in a moment that you can see where the finials were knocked off the top of the fence. Now, before I move, if some of you saw the print that I posted this morning, the color print of something called the Government House, that would be right there where you see the Ann Taylor loft. So if you take a look at that picture, you try to get into the frame of mind that that is what this looks like in the 18th century, the 1700s, and um, through the Revolutionary War. So here we go, the Bowling Green. And we're going to go back out the entrance that we came through, and we'll take a look at where some of those finials were on the fence. And first, of course, we have our designated landmark marker at the entrance here. And where one of the knocked off finials. Oh, I should tell you that the finials and the statue were melted for musket balls for General Washington's army. And speaking of General Washington's army, this is number one Broadway, the first uh, structure we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to move over here a little bit so that you can see it a little bit better. So here we have number one Broadway. At the time we we're speaking of during the Revolutionary War, this was a massive, um, what was the word I'm looking for, mansion uh, built by Captain Archibald Kennedy. Um, John, I am going to at some point stream live on YouTube as well, but I have to get the software for my phone, which I just haven't had time to do so. In the future, I, I think by January, I'll be streaming simultaneously in both places. So thank you for asking. So back to one Broadway. This would have been a beautiful mansion built and owned by Archibald Kennedy. So if you can imagine it, the average building at that time was one or two stories. And they tell us that the Kennedy mansion was at least three. So it would have been much higher than the other buildings. And it was right here at the tip of the island. So from this mansion, you would see New Jersey in the distance. You would look out over the harbor and off to Staten Island, out to the Atlantic Ocean, and you would also be able to see all the way around to the rest of the town, which is blocked now by this big office building. So one Broadway would have been a prime piece of real estate and place to live. In the summer of 1776, it was the headquarters for General Washington and his officers, and it was also the headquarters for one of my favorite generals, Israel Putnam, and I think Henry Knox and Nathaniel Green probably spent some time here as well. So this would have been Washington's headquarters in 1776. And then throughout the occupation of the war, different um, English commanders would have lived here during that time. Are all these building, buildings, businesses now, any apartments? Some are businesses and some are apartments. And I am actually not sure what number one is now. Um, I'm going to back up and show you uh, something on the top of the building that's quite interesting <laughs> in a few minutes. So the building you see today is not that building that stood here during the Revolutionary War, but a building that was originally built in the 1880s by the International uh, Mercantile Marine Company. Yes, John, well, they were very pricey apartments until everyone fled New York and now the value of everything is plummeting. So at one time, yes, it would have been very expensive to live um, down here. So in the 1880s, a company opened here called International Mercantile Marine, um, a steamship company. They carried cargo and passengers. And the building you see today has the original 1880 structure inside of it, but with a limestone facade added in the 1920s. 
Limestone became very popular in the 1920s. And there's another building here around the Bowling Green I'm going to show you that has a brick interior with a limestone facade. So this was added with some really exquisite sculpture. So I'm going to walk over and try to give you a better view of this building. As I mentioned, it was um, both a um, passenger and a cargo steamship line. And the dock was right behind this building. So you would board, you would enter here and board and get on your ship and back. And you can see, I think up on top, the really beautiful top of the entrance, number one, and uh, with an eagle on the top and, um, and the Greek sculptures on the left for commerce and on the right, um, Neptune for the sea. So for sea trade or sea commerce. And you see some um, coats of arms up there or some sh shields and each one of those represents the city where the different cities where they had ports that existed at the time. And I want to show you, let me see if I'm going to try to line this one up. I want to show you the one for New York. I don't know if you can see this well, but I think you see on there that it has a windmill, two barrels on either side of the windmill and a beaver on the top and the bottom. And that is the um, old symbol of New York that represents our early um, wealth in beaver trading and trading other types of things or in commerce. So that is the old symbol of New York dating back to New Amsterdam and everyone would have recognized that as uh, being about New York. And we see them for all the different ports of call for the steamship company. So really, really very beautiful building um, with some um, really fantastic architecture. The arch is quite lovely. Now I want to walk over and I'm going to show you something really neat on the side of the building. Let me see, there's a bus coming down the Broadway at me, two buses coming after me. So I'm gonna scurry across here. And if I get a little closer, up there on the, over the windows, you can see kind of a wave pattern. And we're going to see that wave pattern repeated around the building, also in the limestone. So let me just come over here where you can see that a bit better. And of course, there's a big marker on this building um, telling us all the different things it was over time. So it's just a big marker explaining to us the significance of this building throughout history. And I'm going to back up. There's Battery Park. And you are not going to believe how short a walk I'm going to take and how much we are going to look at and learn in just a very short walk. Now, if I look above that window, you can see the wave pattern, I think, in the limestone up there. So you can see the wave pattern and you can see some more of those beautiful crests, those uh, mosaic crests. There's uh, Liverpool right up above us. I had friends in Liverpool that were watching last week. I don't know, maybe you're watching this week again. Southampton, Sydney, all sorts of cool places that they traveled to. Now, you might notice right above this door, which is now a city bank, we have in the middle of the pediment, the IMM for International Mercantile Marine with two fish on each side and beneath it first class. So if you were traveling first class on International Mercantile Marine, you would enter through this door. You'd enter through here, show your tickets and uh, proceed to board your ship and uh, your stateroom. And you can see also, you see, on top of the lanterns, you can see the um, um, oh, what are they called? The things that Neptune carries. The word just went out of my head. You can see the um, symbols of Neptune up there, the staff that he carries representing the sea. And back there, I'm not going to walk back there, um, near the two subway entrances is the, um, the uh, regular class entrance. So you would enter back there if you were lower class, traveling, regular passenger class. And right behind that building, would have been the shore where the car where the truck is turning right now was the shore and the dock where you would have found your steamship so all of these buildings beyond this are later landfill so international mercantile marine a very beautiful building now this building as you can imagine was landmarked many years ago but about 10 years ago the owners of the building at that time which might have been equitable insurance company i'm not completely sure Excuse me, I'm trying to cross here. The sun is in my eyes. I want to go back over here where we can get a better view. Um, that's sort of what we have to do today is keep walking back and forth so we can get an up-close view and then a more distant view of these buildings 
because they're so big. Trident, yes, thank you. Thank you, Karen, Trident. Oh, I have to go a little bit further. Sorry about that. A little bit further from International Mercantile Marine. All right, and if we look up on the top, way up there, we can see a new addition to the top of the building. So we have a row of big windows with arches, and then a row of smaller square windows, and that level with the arches on the top is new development on the top of that building, and I believe it was in violation of the landmarking of the building when they did it, and uh, there was um, quite a bit of uh, dismay about that, but since the um, construction had already proceeded, they were allowed to add that piece up on the top. And here's just a view of all of the crests on the front of International Mercantile Marine. So very beautiful. And of course, still here right at the entrance to the park. So we haven't even moved very far yet. And I'm going to come up here to the park and turn around and take a look at the customs house. Sorry about that. I'm lo looking for a good spot to stand. Here we go. So this is the customs house and this would have been different things over different periods. I mentioned during the Dutch period it would have been Fort Amsterdam, during the Revolutionary War it would have been Fort George and eventually became this customs house. This customs house was built in um, 19, oh, no, no, not about 1907 and the architect was Cass Gilbert who you might know also did the Woolworth building. It is a beautiful Beaux Arts building with four wonderful sculptures on the front representing the four continents. To the far left is Asia. The next one is America on the left of the stairway. To the right of the stairway is Britannia and to the far right is Africa. And although these statues um, would be seen as politically incorrect today, they were done by Daniel Chester French in the early 20th century. So they do express a 20th century view of the world kind of important to keep in mind. And we look up and we see the beautiful arch up there with um, Liberty on the top of the arch and various other sculptures representing New York. Now an interesting thing is when we look at these windows on the first floor, you see the faces over each window under the pediment. The pediments have the little fish on them. And you see the um, caduceus, which we think of as representing medicine, but at that time actually represented trade. Each one of those faces around the entire building is a different race, and they represent all of the people of the world with whom New York engaged in trade throughout our history, up until the time the building was built in the early 20th century. So each face is sculpted to represent a different race here in um, the world. Very beautiful work done. And at the top of each column is Mercury, which also represented trade and travel. And up on the very top is a beautiful, crest. I don't know if I can see it. Kind of bright up there. You can see a beautiful crest with an eagle and two ladies to each side. And on that shelf are statues representing the history of trade in America from the early Dutch to um, then the modern time, representing all the different countries um, that engaged in maritime trade at that time. So very beautiful statues and very much in need of cleaning. Um, they're far dirtier than they were even a year ago. I find that somewhat fascinating how much dirtier they've become in just one year. Well, today this is owned by the Smithsonian and it is the National Museum of the American Indian. It also houses the National Archives. And if you can ever get to the museum, it really is a wonderful museum that focuses on the native people of this part of America. And most of us are used to what the Southwest art and textiles look like. So it's fun to come to this museum and see what the people of the northern part of this continent um, we're making. There, there are things in this museum that are exquisite beyond belief. Um, one, of them, one of the things I asked to see in here was the pipe that belonged to the Iroquois chief Joseph Brandt when I was working on my book about Theodosia Burr um, as she was friends with him. And I went in and they showed me um, one of his peace pipes and it is an exquisite work of art. So I highly recommend the museum. It's small, you know, you can see it in just a couple of hours. It's not very big. And the interior of this building is also an exquisite work of art with uh, murals from the 1940s depicting um, the activities in the Port of New York. It's just a really beautiful building to see inside and out the Customs House. So let's look around on this side. So we have 
where that government house would have been located if you looked at my print from this morning. And that government house was built in 1790. The idea was for it to serve as a home for George Washington, the president. But the government moved to Philadelphia and it instead became the home of our governor, George Clinton, and became the government house. And after that, it became the customs house until the customs house on Wall Street replaced that. And then this customs house then replaced the building on Wall Street. Customs, of course, being very important to the city of New York, um, as we our entire economy was based on trade at that time. Now, the next building we want to look at is Standard Oil. Now, remember, before there were airplanes, the way you came to New York, or even trains, the way you came to New York was by ship. So the first thing you saw when you came to the city of New York was the southern tip of the island where we're standing. Because of that, even from the colonial period, New York has been very interested in what the southern tip of the island looked like as you approached it. So it's always been very well planned. This was the first skyline that was visible to visitors coming to New York who either weren't coming by train because they were coming by it from another country. And of course, there were no planes. So this would have been the first skyline you saw. So it was very carefully planned. Now over on the right is the Standard Oil building. I'm going to get a little closer and then I'm going to back up again so we can see the top because we really need to talk about it from the bottom up. I'm just going to take a walk over. If you guys have any questions, be sure to ask me. We're passing by the Bowling Green and of course some more of those mounts where they knocked off the finials, the crown finials. That's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> I just love the idea of that, that they came down, tore down the statue and knocked the crowns off. Oh, this is where this is my favorite mount right there, where you can really see where the crown was mounted. OK, so we're coming up a little closer now to Standard Oil. And you might notice right there the Broadway street sign is black which tells us we are in that original colonial district. And the street right there where the blue van is coming through is called Beaver Street, obviously to commemorate the beaver trade. And when we look that way, we're looking east toward the East River. I'm going to continue up the Broadway a little bit. And there's some loud music playing up here. Let me know if it interferes. If it does, I'll move to a different location. So there's Beaver Street and the oldest, oldest streets of New York running in that direction down toward the East River. And you can see the curve in the Broadway coming up in front of us. And in a minute, you'll see probably our most, fa most famous lower Manhattan mascot, the Wall Street Bull, which is not on Wall Street at all. It's really here on Broadway. And, you know, I'm going to stop here because that music is getting very loud. And there's just a close-up of the bull for you. And as usual, people are under the back end of the bull, which is, you know, very popular. So there's the bull. So here we go. Standard Oil. This is another one of those buildings which was originally a brick building um, built by the Standard Oil Company, owned by the Rockefellers. And you might know at one time, they controlled virtually all of the oil production um, in the world. So they built their headquarters right down here at the base of Broadway. And I'm gonna come out here a little bit more so you can see the building a little bit better. Those stones, the, um, the stones were placed here after 9-11 to protect anyone from being able to drive their car into the Bowling Green or into the Bull. And we've got some cobblestones here. I do not know if these are original or what the date of these cobblestones are, but they are very uneven, which makes me think they're from at least the 1800s, if not maybe a little bit older. So here we have the entrance to Standard Oil. The original Standard Oil building was a brick building down here on the lower Broadway, and it was only a fraction of the size of what we see here today. In the 1920s, Standard Oil decided to modernize their building. And of course, they wanted to um, put a limestone exterior on the building. At that time, they also added a lot of uh, beautiful sculpture telling you the story of Standard Oil. Many of these buildings in Lower Manhattan tell you the story of the company that built them. So we see the beautiful limestone facing here. And let's get a little closer and we'll look at the entrance. 26 Broadway. 
when I used to do an architecture tour, this was the only building in Lower Manhattan where the security team allowed me to bring my customers in to um, get a really close up and good look of the building. So they're very, very, they were very, very nice here then. This one and 20 Exchange, was it 20 Exchange? No. Oh, it was the old AIG building on John Street. They also would let me in. So this is the entrance and you have 26 Broadway up there. I don't know if you can see it because this building is very dirty as well, but maybe you can see the SO um, logo up there for Standard Oil. And on each side, you see both hemispheres of the globe um, showing us that um, they do business everywhere in the world. A beautiful entrance, this beautiful Beaux-Arts entrance. And in the middle, you can see a window with three panes. And on each side, you see three oil lanterns, also with um, three columns in each oil lantern. So showing um, that they, you know, light all the lanterns, they light all the lights. And uh, this beautiful, beautiful entrance, of course, with another globe over the entrance. The inside of this building is absolutely stunning. And on the windows, you also see the Standard Oil logo. I can find it with a swan on each side. So very, very beautiful. And eagles up on top of each window. Let's see. Now, I need to back up to tell you a little bit more about the building. So I'm going to walk up here. Oh, while I'm here, here he is, the Wall Street Bull on Broadway. And it's really interesting. I've sort of come full circle these years. I've done my tour. When I first started my tours 15 years ago, there was almost no one here at the um, Bull. Last year at this time, there was probably a two hour wait to have your picture taken with the Bull. And now we're back to very few people here. So I'm hoping that by next year, Things will be back to normal in December and we'll have a nice crowd of people here enjoying uh, New York City during the Christmas holidays. And I'm going to come over here where you can see a little bit more of Standard Oil and you can see that it goes up much pretty high. There's even more on it. And that ledge you see right up there would have been the top of the original brick building. So everything above that came after they did the expansion in 1926 and it goes up much higher than that but I have to move a little bit away and one of the things you see is the way the building curves really neat isn't it you notice it curves with Broadway when they put the expansion on over there on the northern part of the building the architects who did the work were very conscientious of the building fitting in organically with the way the Broadway curves they couldn't change the curvature of Broadway so instead they curved the building to work with Broadway so that when you're walking along here, the building just very organically and nicely fit in with the shape of Broadway. And we're going to walk over here because we want to see the top of Standard Oil. And here's some things still blooming here in the Bowling Green Park as the weather is quite warm. And I can't really see the towers yet. Hold on, I'm getting into position where you can see the towers of Standard Oil. And we're here, you're getting a nice view of the Bowling Green as I walk. And I may have to walk all the way back over here to number one Broadway to do this. Again, I apologize for all of the walking around, but it's so congested down here that it's difficult to see the base of a building and to see the top of the building without taking a bit of a walk away from the building um, to provide room to see the top of it. And that is just a uh, one of the things we have to deal with when we look at architecture. Now you'll also notice, not so much on the Standard Oil building, but we'll see many buildings. Actually, since I'm here at number one again, we'll see many buildings that are ornate on the lower floors, and they're very plain in the middle, and then they're very ornate on the top again. And also the Bowling Green building shows that too. Bowling Green building from the 1890s, and you can see it's very plain in the middle, but it's ornate on the top and bottom. And that again is this new architectural um, reality of the 20th century that people are looking at the building as they're walking by and people are also looking at the building um, from either the harbor as they arrive or out of the windows of other buildings. So now we have to have some ornateness on the top so things don't look too boring. And here's Standard Oil, you can see the curve of it and you can see that original ledge I talked about being the original height of the building and then we get the addition and you notice the towers on 
<laughs> on standard oil are not aligned with the base of the building. And this again is architectural sensibility. There was a sense that there was a growing skyline now in New York City and the towers are aligned with the skyline as it grew. So you see the tower is aligned with the building to the right of it and everything lines up nicely. So the towers are aligned to, to be seen from the harbor or from the tops of other buildings. The base of the building is aligned with the Broadway so that it is um, aesthetically nice to walk by on the bottom. So we start seeing that there are a number of buildings we see down here that are skewed like that. The bottom lines up with one part of the town and the towers line up with the skyline. So another building we want to take a quick look at is the old Cunard shipping line. So all along here on Lower Broadway were shipping companies, steamship companies. So we had International Mercantile Marine, we have the Bowling Green building, which housed various um, businesses from that time. They just restored the Bowling Green building last year. It looks quite beautiful. Let me stop here so you can see some of the beautiful work on this building. Quite lovely, isn't it? Just beautiful to look at. Imagine the number of stonemasons it took to create all of this beautiful work that went on the outsides of these buildings. They're quite magnificent. And here we go. This is all still the Bowling Green building, very large office building. And we want to come up here to the Cunard building. Again, from the 1920s, most of these, this limestone that you see down here is from the 1920s. And this would have been the American headquarters for the Cunard shipping line. Today it's owned by, I think, Cipriani, or they may just lease the bottom. And um, you can see the uh, lobby of this building and a number of different TV shows. It's very popular. There's, we're back to the bowl. We've just been walking in a circle, by the way, within about two blocks. Okay, so we have the Cunard building. Let me get right around in the front. And you can see up there, I think that it says Cunard Line. And right underneath the D in Cunard is Neptune himself. And a couple other winds on each side. And we see some shipping motifs on there. And a beautiful facade of the building that looks like a Greek temple. And this Greek temple motif is very popular in the 1920s um, throughout America. And above the Greek temples, medallions showing different types of sea creatures. And up there they are. I think you can see them a little bit better there. And as we talked about, a plain shaft and then an ornate top with um, another Greek temple on the top. So that popular 1920s architectural style. Now I need to go across the street so that you can see something really spectacular, really spectacular that's on top of the Cunard line. And I'm gonna cross Broadway here and now stand in front of Standard Oil. So you can see that and there's the nice curve of Broadway. So you can imagine that when this was colonial New York looking up Broadway here, all you would see would be country. And uh, to the north, all of those skyscrapers and businesses and all of those attractions you're used to seeing are just um, a daydream away. You know, they're far in the future, not even imagined to the people of the time of the American Revolution. For them, it was just uh, a country lane. And here we go, we're gonna cross Broadway. And, oh, I have to walk down Broadway, excuse me. Well, while I walk down Broadway, let me show you some of the beautiful sculpture here on the Standard Oil building. You can see some of this uh, stonework that's in here. And this is all over the building. Um, Benedict Arnold resided at 3 Broadway. Yes, he did. So if you think of that, Benedict Arnold arrived in New York, I think in 1780, after he did his traitor's thing up at West Point. 
and where the blue awnings are was one Broadway, the finest building in all of New York, and then next to it would have been three Broadway, one of the other most beautiful mansions in all of New York. Um, so we would see um, Benedict and uh, Peggy Arnold living in one of the finest residences in um, occupied New York City during the war. And um, so, so much for that, right? <laughs> so there's quite a bit to be said about that. And, um, quite a few people were not so happy about them living in such an expensive residence when it was felt that Benedict Arnold really um, supplied nothing to the English, right? He is, his, his mission failed. They really didn't get anything from him, but he um, turned out to be quite expensive for them. And I just need to walk over here a little bit. I think I need to cross one more street for you to see what I would like you to see. Just go over here. Okay, and that is the top of the Cunard building. And I think you can see up there men riding seahorses. So look at the magnificent top of this building and how that would have looked as you came in on your ship from the harbor, as nothing would have blocked the view of that then. Beautiful, four magnificent, huge seahorses being ridden by men. Really, really beautiful facade of the building. And we're going to continue down here. We want to go over to Battery Park. Oh, I have a good story to tell you about the Standard Oil building while we're here. Let's just take a look at this one section of Standard Oil. Right over here. That middle section of Standard Oil that's shorter than the rest of the building. We can see the tower up there too, that magnificent tower. This section is smaller because when Standard Oil bought the additional space around their first building in order to develop it, the people who owned this property would not sell it to them. And they were forced to build around that property. Um, when the owner of the property eventually passed away, his family sold the property to Standard Oil and they built this little expansion into the spot where that old property was. And I have been looking for years for a print of what it looked like when that old building was here, and, and I haven't been able to find one. You can see on each side the, again, oil lamps represented all over the standard oil building, the idea of um, oil and uh, the oil lamps lighting America. And here we go up there, the crest with the two beautiful oil lamps. And I'm really surprised at how dirty these buildings have become since I was really looking at them about a year ago. So quite dirty. And of course, the top of the Cunard building with our seahorses and back to the Bowling Green. And now we're going to head over to the Battery and talk a little bit about the extension of the landfill over time. So as New York grew, the bottom part of the island, or the southern tip of the island, remained the most important part of the island for commerce. And there's the harbor down there, or where it's located today anyway. The bottom part of the island was always the most important part of the island for commerce. So the bottom part of the island was expanded first. Um, they made more and more room for ships, docks, and businesses to be located down here. And um, there was a small amount of land, so they cleverly created new land. And the first landfill would have been on the east side in that direction. That little street down there is Stone Street, and that is the street that once went all the way down to the shore. Now on the east side of the island, that shore was at Pearl Street. And we're not going to walk over there today, but I did walk there last Friday, so you might have seen Pearl Street last week if you joined me then. And I'm just heading over now to Battery Park. So New York needed land. We needed more land, so we started building land. And the first landfill did occur over on the east side in the Pearl Street area, beginning in the 1680s. 1680s? I think 1685, can, finished around 1700 or so. So that was the early part of the landfill, and that expanded from Pearl to Water Street. And then in the early 1800s, the next expansion occurred over there from Water Street to where the shore is today. So where South Street Seaport is today, if you've been over there. Now here, I'm getting up to Battery Park. And when I get the light, I'll cross over to Battery Park. 
You can get a very nice view here of the old International Mercantile Marine Building, or One Broadway as it's known. And right there at the back of One Broadway would have been the original shore that I'm talking about now. And I'm going to walk out to where that shore would have been. Is that a ballot truck? Oh my goodness, someone has a sense of humor today. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my, my. So we're coming across to Battery Park. Some of you may have been here. And we get to the flagpole, the old flagpole. This is not the old flagpole, but it is the position of the original flagpole. And where do I want to go? Right there. I have so much glare on my screen, I can't see it that well. At the back of the customs house would have been the original shore of the harbor, if you can imagine. So where you see those two flags blowing together was the original shore of the island. Everything beyond that is landfill. So we can imagine in front of us, we would have had the flagpole. And you can see the flagpole is here celebrating that original flagpole. So we have Fort Amsterdam and surroundings, a little etching that shows when it was Fort Amsterdam. And we have the symbol of the king up there for King George, or the British king, I should say, of many of them. And another little plaque celebrating New Amsterdam and the flagpole that was here. And there we are, oh, showing the trade between the Dutch and the Lenape. And you can see that the Dutchman on the right has a string of wampum that he's using to trade with the gentleman on the left. And wampum was the currency in the area. It was a string of beads uh, made from shells that uh, were found on Long Island. So that was the um, currency of the time. And there's a um, symbol representing um, Federal America. And Battery Park. So I'm thinking the shore would have been just a little bit out here. And you see that fort that I'm heading toward? That's where we're going to go next. When that fort was built, Castle Clinton, it was in the water. And there was a causeway or a walkway that connected Castle Clinton to where we are now. And people love to go out on the causeway in the afternoon and walk in the sun and look at the harbor. So imagining that that was once the shore of the island is uh, um, quite incredible, that that was once out in the harbor is pretty incredible. And all of these buildings you see here that comprise the lower end of Battery Park City were in the water. Indeed, all of Battery Park City was once water. So you can see some of the massive landfill. I'm trying to see, I think this is probably the quickest walk over to Castle Clinton. And I do want to go over to Castle Clinton because last I was there, there was a wonderful Revolutionary War artifact in there. I'm hoping it's still there. But from here, we can also have a wonderful view of the Customs House. And you see that beautiful pink and green mansard roof on the top. And there are so many beautiful architectural elements on this building. And you can see the tridents up on the top. Thank you for reminding me the word trident. And the beautiful design on the top of this building, the urns, most of this um, early late 19th and early 20th century um, iconography on this building. Very, very beautiful. If you want to know all about this building, you can look it up online. Um, Alexander Hamilton Customs House or U.S. Customs House, New York. There's also a website, nyc-architecture.org, where you can look up buildings by address and it will tell you the whole history of those buildings, the architects that worked on them, when they were built, what every little symbol and item on the building means. And uh, you can just spend hours and hours and days you can get the information in that about buildings. And let's see, it's kind of very quiet out here today. Let's see. So this is all just Battery Park. So we're walking out now and what would have been the water at the time I specialize in. And we can take a look back here at One Broadway, which would have been Washington's headquarters in 1776. And look at how beautiful Standard Oil looks from here. And on the top of Standard Oil, if you can believe this, there used to be a flame that spewed out of the top of that building. That's a brazier on the top. And a flame was lit there that lit the entrance to New York City instead of a lighthouse. 
you can also see up there a reproduction of the mausoleum or the temple at Helicarnassus. Um, the word that we get the um, the building we get the word mausoleum from. The first mausoleum was built by the wife of King Mausus, I think around 300 BC in Greece, and thus the word mausoleum becomes known as a burial site. And that's uh, their version of the temple at Helicarnassus, or the mausoleum at Helicarnassus. And what's really crazy is there's a building on Wall Street with that on the top of it as well. Um, so I guess that was just a really popular thing. In the early 20th century, they uh, often put replicas of the seven wonders of the ancient world on these buildings. So one of the other things you see, let me turn around again, sorry about that. One of the other things you see are these obelisks, Egyptian obelisks you see on many of the buildings too. And I know a lot of people associate that with uh, Freemasonry and I'm not going to get into the Freemasons today, but you might know I'm researching them for my next book which is going to be about the influence of uh, Freemasonry in New York during the federal period or the period after the American Revolution and the rapid growth of New York City in the late um, 18th and early 19th centuries. I got interested in that when I visited there to do an episode of Mysteries at the Museum and saw a lovely sword presented to them by the Irving family of Washington Irving. And on the marker for the sword, it said that all of the Irving men were Freemasons except Washington Irving and of course if you know me you know that immediately sparked my interest and I needed to know why was Washington Irving the only one who wasn't a Freemason and you know what I still don't know the answer to that question and um, I am hoping to find out by going through the archives here at the Robert Livingston Masonic Library to try to figure out why they were all Freemasons except Washington Irving although Washington Irving was um, quite radical and um, what do I want to say um, anti-establishment for his time so it just might have been that he was rebelling against the common authority at that time when all the men became Freemasons or it could be something more maybe it's something more notorious but we'll have to uh, find out oh look at where I am there's a beautiful view of One World Trade Center let me enlarge it for you so there's One World Trade Center which is a little bit of a walk from us it's not as close as it looks and some more of those early um, buildings and skyscrapers. That, build, that building right in the middle of our picture um, was another phenomenally beautiful office building um, built after the landfill. Here, I think this early landfill was probably, I want to say maybe 1920s or so, maybe a little bit before that. Let's see, Dan, I'm on Google Maps while you're talking. Oh, you're struggling to find out where I am? Standard Oil, go down Broadway to the bottom of Standard Oil or type in 26 Broadway and Standard, that's the address of Standard Oil and it's right by the Bowling Green or you could also um, look for Bowling Green Park and I'm to the south of that. So Standard Oil is up there behind the tree. There's the Customs House we were talking about at the Bowling Green and I am out here now in Battery Park and by the way, this building with the sun glistening off of it, 17, 17 State Street is one of my favorite buildings down here on the Battery. And if you're out in the harbor coming toward the city, the curvature of that building lines up perfectly with the curvature of the bottom of the island. And it's really beautiful to see. And I think one day I am going to uh, take us out on the Staten Island Ferry and talk about the history of New York Harbor. I think that would be a really fun thing to do. Um, so let me know what you think of that. I think one day we'll take a ride on the Staten Island Ferry together. I haven't been on the ferry in quite a long time. So it'll be fun for me. Oh, and off in the distance you can see, let me enlarge this the Statue of Liberty out there in the harbor. It's a little hazy today, but there she is. And let me tell you, normally in mid-December, the line for the Statue of Liberty is about a three hour wait. And I truly am hoping we'll be back to normal next year. And this plaza is just packed with people as the line would circle around and around um, toward the ferry for the, Stat for, for the Statue of Liberty Ferry. So this is Castle Clinton. It was built in the 1820s. Hopefully there's a plaque on there that will tell us. It's part of the National Park Service and Department of the Interior. And I'm just going to turn around. Oh my goodness. Wait till you see this. This beautiful panorama of the old New York City skyline. 
Is that beautiful or what? Wow, imagine coming in on your ship. Maybe when my grandfather came in 1914 and seeing this beautiful skyline as his ship arrived at Ellis Island. I can only imagine um, what he must have felt, you know, how he must have felt seeing this for the very first time and knowing that this would be his future home and the home of his children and grandchildren and descendants. And that's one Broadway um, right in the middle of the picture there and you can see Standard Oil. It just must have been stunning for him to experience. He passed away before I was born as did my um, grandmother so I never got to hear the first-hand story of their arrival. She and uh, my aunt came about five years later so he came first and he worked as many immigrants did and then his wife and daughter joined him five years later when he had the money to send for them. And then their subsequent children, my father and my uncle, were born here. So here's just a little item about Castle Clinton. It says it was built in 1811. That's right, I think it was supposed to be a defense against a potential attack in the War of 1812, which never got to New York. And you can see here on this print that Castle Clinton is out in the water and it's surrounded by boats. So that's really kind of interesting. So right now we're um, out in the water. I just love that idea that, and here are various pictures of it over time. Let me give you a view. And so this is the um, entrance to the visitor center. You can see this beautiful brownstone that it's made of. And we have our Castle Clinton National Monument. So part of the National Park Service. And here we go. There's Battery Park City and some more of the skyline. And let's go into Castle Clinton. And I am very much hoping that the item I came here to see is still here. Let's see. Okay, so we're in Castle Clinton. This, by the way, is where you get your tickets to go to um, Liberty Island, to the Statue of Liberty. Let me see a few people are in line to do that today. Oh, and let me see. I am looking, looking, looking. I, the sun is in my eyes. I see some benches. Oh my goodness, well one item is not here. Oh, it is here! Yes! Now, if we've been walking around and you've been wondering why I haven't talked about the name of Battery Park, it's because I wanted to get here to talk, you, talk to you about why it's called Battery Park. And that is because long before Castle Clinton was here and the shore was all the way where we started, this is where the gun batteries were located um, during colonial America, the British had a whole row of guns lining the shore out into the harbor in case anyone tried to invade and take the, take the area from them. I mean, they conquered it, right? They took it by force, and they were, of course, concerned someone else would try to take it by force. So there was a gun battery lining the shore, pointing out into the harbor, and thus the term, the battery, or today, Battery Park. Now, this is not a colonial-era cannon. This is a later cannon, and here I'll show you that there were 28 guns here at Castle Clinton to protect New York City. And this would be in the early 1800s, so I think this says 1814. And you can see the little windows where the guns pointed out of. And since this was in the water, of course, there was nobody walking around on the other side of the window. This was just out in the harbor itself to protect the entrance to New York City. It's a really lovely cannon. I don't know anything about cannon or this type of artillery. I'm not sure what kind it is. Let me see. Does it say? It says the force employed here will be two gunners and eight matroses, artillerists to each gun. To every section or chamber of two guns and non-commissioned officers. So let me see if it says anything about what type of cannon this is. It doesn't. Okay. So we're inside Castle Clinton, the old fort as it was, and got the nice little windows. This is really quite well preserved. Look at the beautiful arch here. Isn't that nice? Nice old brick brickwork. Beautiful arch. And we want to come around because the big thing I wanted to show you, of course, I wanted to show you the cannon, but the other thing I wanted to show you was this. 
and I know it just looks like a whole bunch of rock. <laughs> it doesn't really mean anything to you unless you're a New York City history nerd like me and you look at this. This is a piece of the old seawall that was found when they were expanding the island out here. Um, or actually, I think they found this when they were building the new, um, the new uh, subway stop here at South Street Seaport on the number one line. So this is one of the original retaining walls around the bottom of the island that was found when they were excavating to expand that, that, subway, that subway station. And it was an incredible find because although we know that the island was expanded a number of times, oh, hello to Denmark. Thank you for joining me again. Um, so we know that the island was expanded multiple times, but we never knew exactly where those expansions took place or where those original seawalls were. And when they built the new subway station, they found a bit of that original seawall. And so to some people, this just looks like a pile of old rocks. But to me, this is an incredible find because it gives us some idea of where that original shore was located. They have this on display for us here. And they also have, to let us know what it is, a display explaining what all of it means. So the history of the battery wall and the discovery of the wall. And I'm going to get a little closer so that we can look at the maps. So here we have the map that you probably have seen me use many times on my tours or even on my posts. A pretty um, standard map of New York City. This is 1767 and that triangle up on the top would be City Hall Park today or the Commons. And we're down here at the bottom. You see that fort that you see would be Fort George and we are currently in the water beyond where Fort George was on this map. So we are on landfill and that little triangular park to the north of the fort, fort is where we were walking around um, the Bowling Green and you can see Broadway going directly up through the middle of the town the docks on the bottom on the East River and you can see the Hudson River on the top so I think we have a map here that tells us what those expansion sections looked like and you can see a landfill as it went out over time and they have a nice little uh, map here showing you um, where those expansions went. And you can see that there's expansion done on the island in 2005 and 2006, which was there to accommodate um, expanding Battery Park City. So you can see that old map. So if I stick my hand in here, this is where we started, the Bowling Green, right? So this is the Bowling Green. The um, bull would be here. Standard Oil would be over here. International Mercantile Marine here and where the fort is is where we started which is the Customs House and we have now walked out into the water where Castle Clinton would be on this map. So very very cool and you can see a picture of them discovering the seawall as they were doing the excavation for the subway line very neat and up here the different segments as they were labeled as the archaeologists um, examined them. So very very neat an incredible piece of our city's history right here which just looks like an old wall but if you're really interested in the expansion and the growth of New York City this wall becomes a major part of our city's history and a great archaeological find and that it tells us where exactly those various seawalls were located and from here you can see beautiful 17 State Street glistening in the sun and another flagpole and let's see I think that's all I have to tell you about today so here we're going to end here at beautiful Castle Clinton this is the original location of Castle Clinton Dan as it was um, as it was built And um, heading out here through the door just takes you back out into another section of Battery Park and over to the um, Liberty Island Ferry. I just love all this old brownstone. Isn't it beautiful? And the brickwork. Oh, let's take a look at those beautiful bricks. Look at that. 
This is a beautiful remnant of our um, city's past. Built, you know, originally as a military installation, but then later became what was called Castle Garden. It became, you know, sort of a public outdoor garden for people to use. And of course, the skyline view from here is magnificent. Look at that. The Lower Manhattan skyline. So one day we'll take a walk along Wall Street and we'll talk about the history of Wall Street um, from the 1600s up through the skyscraper wars of the 1920s. And from this vantage point, we don't see any of the Wall Street skyscrapers. Um, we do see one Wall Street, but not the big ones because of our angle. But we do see beautiful um, Standard Oil and Old One Broadway and some other really lovely stuff. So if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I think we're done with our tour today. And thank you all very much for joining me. If you like the tour, please consider giving me a donation at uh, paypal.me front slash Patriot Tours, as I have not been conducting um, paid tours now for nearly a year. So anything you would like to donate is well, well, well appreciated. And I'm just giving you a final view of the interior here of um, Castle Clinton. And for some reason, I'm not sure they have a little plaque here about Grant's tomb, which is quite far from where we are right now. Um, but this is another building uh, from the Federal Park Service Grant's tomb. So here we are, and I will leave you with this stunning view of Lower Manhattan. And thank you for joining me, and I will see you again next Friday. If you're interested in Revolutionary War history, next Thursday night, live with Mrs. Q. Mrs. Q will be talking about Christmas of 1776, the dire situation of George Washington's army, and an incredible pamphlet called The Crisis. These are the times that try men's souls. So consider joining me Thursday night live with Mrs. Q, and I will be back next Friday with another view of historic New York City. Um, thank you, everyone, and I will see you all again soon.